This is April 12, 2020. I am Ricky Berger. I am joined by David Halperin Shihan, my sensei from Framingham Akikai, and Joe Birdsong Shihan from Aikido of Austin. And this is Aikido Perspectives. Oh. Senseis, how cue are you? Cue the music. Yeah, cue Thank the music you. by Chris Niskola. <laughs> oh, it's not here yet, huh? No, no, no. Uh, Sensei Joe, we always say that because Chris Neskala from our dojo is somehow in the Ethernet in the, uh, the constructing our theme, which has not been delivered yet. Even better. Uh, even, even better. How is everyone? Fine. We have a beautiful day down here in Austin, Texas, and I hope the same for you all. Yeah, we have a, actually a beautiful day up here, but just not as warm as Austin, but it's about 60. It feels pretty good. Yeah. So today's episode is 40 questions for two Shihans. And uh, I constructed some questions, passed them around. Uh, um, sensei said it's okay. So uh, this can go anywhere that this is going to go. And I I'll just start it off um, asking irreverently, how long have you guys known each other? Hmm. Well, I think we met around 1979. Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking 1979, 1980. I, I, I counted about, it's either 39 or 40, 40 years. We started. Uh, yeah, we, um, I, I remember Joe being um, one of uh, the people who was with Toei Sensei at a, uh, one of the, I guess one of the first USAF uh, meetings that took place, used to take place down in Florida. Uh, at the winter seminar, I think it was at the winter seminar. That, yeah, that's and, right, David. Um, he was with um, Daryl Tangman and um, Richard Reed. I recall yeah. those were the three guys. Yeah, yeah. Richard, Richard was at that time the president I of the of the Midwest Aikido Federation. You know, before we had the United States Aikido Federation, there was a there were Tohei Sensei had the Midwest Aikido Federation uh, in 1972. And so uh, the USAF didn't get started until 76. So it was, it was those winter camp. Uh, we had three, three meetings, the USAF, uh, New York, Chicago, and Sacramento were the first three. And then uh, I think 1979 or 80, we went to uh, Hollywood, Florida, and that was, and then we, we started doing, uh, there was winter camp, and that was a USAF meeting. So that's where we met. I remember um, talking to David. We were at, uh, we were at the bar, and we had, we had met, <laughs> we had met, and we were, we were always at the bar. <laughs> we, were, we were talking, we were talking to one of the bartenders and and uh they were asking us where we were from and so we we became the uh boston austin connection at that time we just told the person to call us austin call it call me austin call him boston <laughs> <laughs> i think we austin and austin Austin and Boston, and that was the way it was. And it worked at the bar, I'll tell you that. Yeah. It did it work? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What was uh, your rank at that time, you guys? Oh. No, Joe was much senior to me. Yeah, oh. but, but probably not much in rank. At, at that time, I was, uh, I was uh, probably a, a knee don, maybe. Second. Yeah. Second. I was still white belt at that time. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we... That's that's where we. But in the last uh, last sixteen seventeen years, uh, David David has come come down here from two thousand and four until uh, this this was the first this is the first uh, April he hasn't come down for our uh, Ocean Sensei Memorial. So in the last sixteen seventeen years, we've become much closer. Mm -hmm. but that's when we that's when we got started though back in. Hollywood, Florida. That's excellent. Fun. That's excellent. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead with a, uh, with with this question. So this is we're firing up in question three. What's sure. the craziest thing that each of you has seen on the map in the world <laughs> of the keto? 
<laughs> I, you know, I just jump right in, don't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, let's see. Did you can report? <laughs> well, I never saw anyone throw up on the mat. I will say that. I've never seen that. I saw someone, I saw people come close. But uh, they were always able to dash off the mat in time. Um, let's uh, see. What was it? A couple of years ago, uh, during during testing, one of the, I think the the, the Nage got kind of uppity with the Ukes, and one of the Ukes picked the Nage up and <laughs> threw him on his head, just <laughs> gra gra grabbed him and threw him down and. We know who that is, but we don't. We will. Uh, his name. His name won't be mentioned. He oh, knows. he 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 was an uke, and he threw the not pick the right. nage up. And yeah, him. exactly. Yeah, pick the, pick, yeah. The, pick the nage up, and was asked not to do that anymore. Yeah, well, that that set off quite a debate about the propriety of doing that. Personally, I was of the camp that felt like because of nage malfeasance during the uh, freestyle that the the UK's act was justified. Yeah, that's where I was. I came in that one. Right. I can. I can. And 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 I saw it, and I held my breath at the time. But but uh, when I when I look back, when I look back on the evidence, I I, I have to agree with David. <laughs> <laughs> on review, on video review. <laughs> on re on re yeah, we had to review review the play, and we we think that. Nage uh, could have had a, shown a different attitude. Right. So there's no flag on the field. Yeah, there was. Well, no, not not on the field. <laughs> yeah. So is is there an appropriate time that you, that resistance can go to that level, given uh, whatever Nage is doing to you? How do you figure where, where that lives, Shihans? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a it's a case by case. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an answer that we can all give. It's a case by case situation. Uh, you know, one time a couple of students asked Tohei Sensei, "When can we kill somebody, Sensei?" Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when would that be right? And so Toy Sensei said that uh, no, no time. I can't tell you. I can't tell you that, nor will I tell you that. And and uh, because uh, I, if I said anything about that, uh, you, and you got caught, and you would you would blame me. You, know, <laughs> you would say that my teacher told me it was okay. So that's. Uh, Wow. Yeah, it, you know, you don't, you don't. Yeah, because the, the teachers can't tell how stupid the students really are. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree that you just don't, you don't know where they're coming from. They may, that, that may have been a, an old, an old uh, wound that just got torn open. Oh, no. You know, on that subject, uh, uh, I, I can recall a time I may have told you guys this, but uh, back um, after Steven Seagal's first movie was out, Above the Law, mm -hmm. and um, at that time, a lot of sort of different kind of people were coming to the dojo, uh, inspired by that movie. And um, one day I was at the dojo doing Saburi, um, and I was the only one there, and a guy came in, and, you know, he said, is this Aikido? I said, yeah. He said, how long do I have to practice? Oh, no, he said, do you teach the killing techniques? <laughs> and I said, we used to, but we ran out of students. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. That was, that was when, we, when the dojos were really thinning out during that Stephen Seagal period. Yeah. Lots yeah. Of what, what happened during that? I, I, had, I had a Seagal question way later on, but let's bring it up. What happened during that, that period in the keto with your dojos? Well, actually, I don't know what it was like in uh, at the NEA, but we had we started a beginners program, and it was it was a, a month long program, two days a week, and it would start the first Tuesday of every month, and we had so many people calling 
uh, and wanting to start Aikido, that I literally said to them, um, our beginners class starts on Tuesday, the first Tuesday of the month. So wait till then, and then you have a month, and you'll all come in, and then you'll move on to the regular classes after a month. Nowadays, I couldn't tell somebody to wait for a month. I tell them to come right in. So right. what we had was just 15, 20 people a month coming in. So it was a big, it was a big Aikido bubble. It was the first time. And just uh, so we had lots of people. I could actually put them on a waiting list and they would come in. Now uh, we just ask them to come in and and do do it like that. We didn't have a before that we didn't have a beginners program. So we so we started a beginners program. So there's so many people. Were these people different kinds of people than the normal Akita people that start? Mm -hmm. the, the sort of whatever the wave was from Seagal. My my experience. My experience wasn't that there were any or differently or oriented people, uh, but I can I can say uh, that I don't during that period of time I don't think I have any any members of the dojo that that came in at that time, and that was uh, the the late the late uh, uh, late nineties. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's. But I'd get people calling, they would say, oh, um, do you do Aikido like, uh, like Steven Seagal? And I, and I would say, we do Aikido, and, and Steven Seagal does Aikido. And then when people ask Tohei Sensei about, about it, what do you think? Sensei would say, he's a movie actor. That's, that's in, what he's doing is for the movies. It's not necessarily not Aikido, but he's a movie actor. That's, that's how he, he explained his, his uh, wow, interesting. Feeling, feeling about that. David Sensei, do you have any uh, stories about uh, Steven Seagal from your experience? Uh, well, that terrible? Um, I, don't th I, don't, I think I was gonna say, I don't think we got that big a surge at that time. I think we, but, but we definitely got an increase and definitely more people around. If you said Aikido, there was a chance that people would know what you were talking about, uh, yeah. which wasn't the case uh, before or after for that matter. But Right, right. Um, yeah, I met Steven Seagal a couple times. One time he came to New England Aikikai to see Kanai Sensei. And then um, another time I was out in L.A. Uh, and I practiced at the dojo he had at that time in, uh, I think it was West Hollywood. Um, so I met him a couple times and, um, you know, he was very nice to me, but, uh, uh, <laughs> he, he, something happened with him and Kanai Sensei. Um, I don't know exactly what, but, um, I was in the dojo. I was the only one there again doing Saburi and, um, it was before class and he came in and, um, uh, he, he asked to see Sensei, and so I, Sensei was back in his office, which was kind of behind the Kamiza, and uh, so I brought him back there, and I went to doing Saburi. The mirrors that we did Saburi in front of were uh, right near the door into Sensei's office, so that's where I was. So I was pretty near the door, so I could hear the murmuring of their voices. I couldn't really hear what they were saying. And uh, they talked for a while. It was blah, 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 blah. That's, and then suddenly I hear Sensei, bah! <laughs> and he starts yelling and, uh, you know, uh, really yelling and which wasn't that usual for him. He didn't do that very much. And, uh, he's yelling, he's yelling. And like, uh, I'm like, Holy crap. And, uh, then the door opens, Steven Seagal walks out, he goes down, walks down the, to the other end of the mat, sits down on the visitor's bench and he sits there and, um, he went, you know, he, he watched class that night and he left after class. Um, I don't think since I interacted with him again. So I was uh, really curious what had happened, but um, I couldn't just run right in and say, hey, Sensei, what happened? You know? <laughs> so I had to wait, had to wait a few days and till, you know, all those guys I think were the same. You had to catch them in the right mood if you wanted them to talk about certain things. And, you know, you, you, a lot of it was timing, just when they felt like talking. But finally, 
I said to him, uh, so Sensei, I, uh, I noticed Steven Seagal was here the other day. Said, yes. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> I said, uh, well, uh, I heard at one point you were really yelling at him. Like, what, did something happen? And he goes, eh, he was talking like a gangster. <laughs> which, which I took to mean that there's a, I believe there's a gangster dialect Yakuza use that's a dialect of Japanese. And if you talk in that dialect to someone who's like a samurai, that's very insulting. Oh. So okay. uh, yeah. that's what I, that's, that was my interpretation of the whole thing. Um, but, um, uh, so that's what he said. And that was that. And then, wow. uh, and then, uh, uh, sometime later I was out in LA and I went to his dojo in LA and, uh, after class, uh, he sat me down and, uh, you know, once he found out I was Kanai Sensei's student, sat me down on the bench after class. Kelly LeBrock was sitting between us. I was, that sounds well, right. like, well, you know, <laughs> and, uh, so, it, and basically he was asking me why can I sense I didn't like him? And I just said, I don't know. <laughs> You're too tall. You're too tall. <laughs> yeah. Too tall, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I just, I, 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 you know, I didn't really know anyway. So I didn't. Was the guy a movie star at that time? Yeah, he was, um, well, I'm not sure if he was, a, if he was with LeBrock, he was, he was already starting. I don't know when. I don't know when uh, Above the Law first came out. Yeah, it, it, when, he, when that movie came out, he became a star, but he became a much bigger star after he made a few movies. So she yeah. was in the, his second movie, so this must have been around the, the first movie. Actually, no, this must have been right around the time the first movie was, was coming out. That's right, because I don't think I knew who he was when I first saw him at New England Nike Kai, exactly. I guess I knew his name and I knew he was something, but... And then, because I remember after I went to his dojo, when I came back, I did some of the techniques he was doing and people would say, oh, he did that one in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hadn't seen the movie, so I didn't know. Is there anything well, about the flavor of what he does that you guys like at all? Oh, yeah. it, it looks so different. It's... For for me, no, I don't like it. It's it's just like it's movie. It's like he gets he gets beat up and then you know he beats up people, and mm -hmm. and you have to do it. And and you know I tell people if you want to if you want to see Aikido in the movie, you sometimes can go. You can see that above the law. You know he does a that that movie um, shows O oh Sensei as a as an old man and is doing a demonstration. And then he does a demonstration with, what, what's that guy's name, David? Oh, oh. Nobu uh, the, the guy who The guy who came uh, that has the dojo now, his- Oh, Matsuoka. Matsuoka. So uh, I, had, I had three students. I had three students that told me about, uh, about him. One, two of them, Met him in Japan, and I had a I had a student in my my first dojo uh, in, in Champaign, Illinois. It was a college college dojo, and she had she was a wife of a professor and 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 lived lived in Japan and actually studied with with uh, Steven Seagal, and uh, but she never really spoke to spoke to me about it. Uh, what she did say, and then I had another student that, that was living in Japan, going to school, and took up uh, Aikido while he was there. And he said he went to visit uh, that dojo. And in order to, do, to do, do Aikido at that time, you also had to be part of his tea ceremony and show, uh, Shoto calligraphy uh, drawing and, and things like that. So he was... At that Japanese dojo, he was promoting he was promoting cultural activities along with uh, uh, with Aikido, hmm. and uh, and then the third third uh, person was uh, I have a 
member of the dojo now who studies with Masaoka and uh, Sensei. And uh, he, he uh, basically said that uh, he, that Masaoka just, he and, he and Seagal split. And then he went back to, he went back to Japan and, and studied with uh, Abe Sensei, who apparently was the, uh, inst the calligraphy instructor of O Sensei. Mm -hmm. And so then he came back to the United States. So <laughs> tangentially that, that relationship with Masaoka, but I never met either one of them. And in terms of his Aikido in the movies, I, I kind of liked it in the first couple of movies. I think as, as time passed, he moved, he moved uh, nuts uh, away from Aikido. But um, I thought right. the, first, the first couple of ones, the first few ones, I forget how many, when yeah. he was still kind of doing Aikido, I thought it was good for people to see, you know, what could be a combat application of Aikido. Right. So I, I liked that. I liked it in that respect. And I thought, I thought he, I thought he had like insight into how that worked. And uh, so I, I definitely had some respect for how he was uh, portraying that uh, technically. And uh, yeah, I, I like that part. You, David, I liked, I liked what I saw. It just later on when he was slamming people's heads in, into the, uh, uh, refrigerator or whatever he was doing, whatever he was doing with his, his coup de gras. Yeah. 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 They were, they got a little wild at the end. Well, you know, yeah, exactly. I mean, it kind of got wilder and wilder, but, uh, as time passed, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think overall he definitely raised the profile of Aikido. So, uh, yeah, definitely. You know, net net, it's probably, uh, you know, a very positive thing. Well, that's a fascinating, uh, discussion. Um, I was kind of, I was trepidatious about bringing up Saga, but I'm glad you guys talked about that. It's 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 um, really interesting. Oh, okay, let me ask another question in these 40 questions for Tushihan. What is your preference, if you have a preference, joint locks or projections? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, that's a great question. <laughs> okay, if you say so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of ways to hold a joint. And, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, you know, you can always you can always return to joint locks if you're tired. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I love I love every aspects of Aikido. You know, uh, coming and having David down here and learning, learning, uh, Kanai Sensei's movements. Uh, these are, these are movements that I, I try to incorporate in, in to, uh, our dojo and they were, they were mainly throws. So, and, and Toei Sensei was very elegant with his throwing. And, uh, so, you know, there was the dynamics of the dynamics of, uh, throws you know you can lean you can lean into that i like that and i certainly like all of kanai sensei's sensei's movements uh so but i would say for me i don't i don't have a i don't i don't have a a, a favorite uh the hardest one for me is ikkyo ura shomenuchi ikkyo ura i can hardly i still i still struggle with that Somebody, if I got a big, a big, strong uke, doesn't want me to do much. I can, it's hard, even after many years of practice, it's hard to, to, to take it, do a pin. But any rate. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Shomunuchi Ikkyo Omote is like one of the hardest techniques. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it's interesting. Wow, that's um, fantastic. But can I sense I said there's really no, uh, fundamental difference between a joint lock and a projection. It's all, it's, it's all the same principle. Um, and, uh, he said that, um, I don't know, you know, it's like, it, it's hard to separate out some part and say, Oh yeah, I, I like that part best. I mean, yeah, it's fun to make big throws are fun. I like that, but 
you know, the, it's really the whole thing together. That's the, it's, it's hard to pick it apart, and, you know, evaluate it in parts. Ricky, one of the things that uh, when you read, when you read uh, Aikido books and they talk about uh, the concept of kudin, which is personal transmission of individual information to a student. It's, it's as David says, Sensei says, the principles of both projection and locks are the same. And so, you know, when you're doing things, uh, I was I was throwing somebody and getting ready for my knee don examination or something. And sensei came up behind me and just said, "You're not a machine. <laughs> You're not a machine, Joe. You you've got to feel feel the technique. You just can't just repeat. You're not a drill press. You just can't keep doing the same thing over and over and over and think you're getting better." And it was like, what? Yeah, okay, I'm not a machine, which means that I have to have some kind of, I have to feedback and get feedback. So it's things like that that you, even when he said it, I could understand it. But, you know, after years and years, then you, you begin to understand what, what these uh, off, the, off the cuff remarks mean. But at the time, yeah. You didn't. I, I didn't. You hear it, and you, you understand the, the English or Japanese word, but you, you don't have a really grasp of the meaning. What do you think, David? Yeah, well, I was just thinking um, it reminded me of uh, something. Uh, someone asked Kanai Sensei, well, what are you supposed to do on an, a Shodan, Nidan, and Sandan tests? Or something like some question like that. I forget if he wrote this down or he just said it. I think I heard him say it, but so he said, Shodan, you have to show you can do the techniques correctly. Nidan, you do that plus add power. Sandan, show Aikido's good part. Wow. Um, what did he mean? What do you think he meant by the good part? I mean, I think he meant that th same thing the Toei Sensei was talking about, that that sort of spontaneous, fluid, um, mm. you know, uh, beautiful, uh, harmonious power, you know, thing. Uh, yeah. And, and um, uh, you know, the thing that when you see it, like when you see somebody doing good Aikido and it's like really good, you go, wow, that's, that looks good. You know, that's good. And yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but I mean, it, it's, as usual, he left it to everybody to figure out what he was talking about. Right. You know, Aikido's good part. Yeah. And I think there's been plenty of discussion since then about what he meant by that. Yeah. But that was my interpretation. Yeah. You know, the, you know, the other thing this reminds me of is just the, uh, the, uh, one distinction as opposed to like joint locks or projections, but we, we would have these culture shocks when we would practice with the teacher, another one of the teachers sort of in our group of teachers. So when, when I would go to Tohi Sensei's class, typically the way I remember it was any technique he did, he would do six or eight different ways to do it. And Kanai Sensei was always, you know, a mote and ura, you, you know, one way, four times, bang, practice. And, and so we, I really struggled to grasp six or eight variations in the same demonstration. And, and so that was just really interesting uh, distinction about their, their both approaches. And uh, uh, it was very challenging. And I think it went, you know, the other way too, like, so, and that was true of all, all those teachers, you know, if we went to Chiba Sensei's class, that was hard to grasp exactly what he was doing and right. Sugano Sensei, etc. But uh, Toei Sensei really was, was unique in, uh, I think, in that respect. Yeah. Well, I asked uh, Yoshioka Sensei, a teacher from Hawaii, and we were, we were practicing, he, he was at a summer camp, and I said, why? Uh, sensei, why did uh, why does uh, Tohei Sensei show show all these techniques uh, at the same time? 
well, he's, he's showing like five or six techniques. And Yoshioka Sensei said to me, how many, well, how many did you get? I said, well, I got two and, and I saw a third one. I saw them all, but I maybe got two or th maybe, maybe three, two, I would say two. And he said, well, he showed six and I got all six. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a six dot at the time. And I said, well, and why is he doing that? He says, because you're, here we are at summer camp or at a big seminar. And he says, you've got beginners all the way up to I'm a six dot. And, and Yoshioka Sensei would, would come to Sensei's classes. And he didn't come to all of them, but he came to some of them. And, uh, and he says, because there's such a wide range of students, he's allowing the higher ranking people to uh, catch on. You don't have to do this way. And, and Sensei basically um, would, could add, add techniques, do, add a variation to the technique simply by open, his opening movement. He may, he may do an arimi, he may do tenkan, he may do ten shim. Uh, he may do arimi tenkan before he started. So that would increase the, he could still be doing ikkyo, but he would just open it up in different ways. So, so, so he did that a whole lot. I, re, I remember being angry at some people that used to call him 57 variety Heinz. <laughs> <laughs> like the ketchup and it was like that you know how you are protective with protective just like you know you get mad at people are putting your your sensei down or making fun of them yeah so, oh yeah now we didn't you know have have high tolerance for that but but that's because what that's exactly what they would say i we didn't get it he did six and he did six techniques and we didn't get them all. So me neither. <laughs> it was amazing wow. to watch though. I mean, it was, yeah. you, you would just go, wow. Uh, even if you couldn't get more than two or three, a lot of times right. I got one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, uh, he, he was an interesting character, but you know, they all had this sort of these unique personalities and right. ways of expressing themselves and you know tohei sensei at least from the perspective of an of a not his student but knowing him you know he always seemed very very strict and you know straight laced and he was always wearing a suit and tie or jacket and tie and uh just you know very stern he had this stern visage uh but then now uh, you know once i got to know him a little bit he was funny he had yeah. this dry sense of humor that yeah. was so so good. It was so. He yeah. was so funny. Yeah. Well, you should tell a you should tell a story that where, where you had to go to uh, Chicago when when you were uh, sensei was asking you to to go to Shikaku. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I forget who said what in that story. You know, you, you remember it? Do you remember how it went? Down? Well, you you told me that. Some, you were practicing with, with uh, Kanai Sensei, and he basically, during, the, during your practice or something, said uh, to you, uh, you, you know, go to the Shikaku, the, the, <laughs> the dead corner, the safety zone. Yeah. Go to Shikaku. But you didn't hear Shikaku. You heard Chicago. <laughs> and, so you went. <laughs> and, so, and so you were asking, you were wondering, why does Sensei want me to go to Chicago? Does he just want me to go to Chicago to, to, to practice with Tohei Sensei? Is that what he wants you to do? And get, out, get out of here. And if you want to learn, go to Chicago. And then finally, you heard, he said, you said something, maybe you said something to, why do you want me to go to Chicago? And he said, not Chicago, Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> go, go to the safety place. Go to the go to yeah. the dead corner. Anyway. Actually, like back in those days, that I, I hope that was when I was starting. Um, <laughs> he, he talked about uh, entering into Chicago a lot. Mm -hmm. She always did it. He never changed that. He was considered that one of the, 
I think, the three most fundamental principles of Aikido. Right. Um, so like Joe said, shikaku is like the dead angle or the, the opponent's weak angle or weak <coughs> position. And um, so uh, Aikido technique always starts by entering in some way into, into shikaku. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I started, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know anything. I mean, <laughs> as everybody starts that way, I guess. But, um, yeah, I was, I was trying to start it out. But, <laughs> see, that's a good example of how, you know, people do Aikido and they, they hear something or see something and they apply their logic to it and yeah. uh, arrive at the completely wrong conclusion about whatever it is. <laughs> Sensei, let me just uh, step in for a second and say it's just it's so magnificent to see you listen to you guys talk about when you weren't because I look at you guys as gods. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a beginning student and I look at you guys and, it's, and you know, <laughs> you, better get, you better get over that, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> but to hear you guys talk about when you were beginners or things like, oh, I got two of them. It's 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 amazing. And it's 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 really wonderful to hear as, as for those who are rising up and trying their best. Um, uh, David Sensei, you had a story about something you drew on your gi once. Oh, yeah. Can you tell that? Another, is that I did so many embarrassing things, you know. <laughs> Mark, I'm going to ask you to tell that story. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, this was, when I, this was when I had first started. It was New England Nike Kai was in Central Square. So that, that was before, uh, I guess it was before 79. So, you know, um, anyway, so, you know, I noticed people wrote their names and stuff and magic marker on their geese to, you know, and stuff like that. And actually at that time, since it was pretty strict about people wearing the New England Nike Kai patch on their shoulder. But um, anyway, uh, so I noticed people wrote their names. So I decided uh, I would get, you know, put some cool Japanese characters on my geese instead of my name. So, I, I, you know, this is so, I, I, I'm cringing even to tell the story, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was going to get in trouble. So, <laughs> so I got somebody who spoke Japanese and I said, okay, uh, I want to put earth, wind, and fire, which I thought was, I don't know, it sounds like vaguely. A good band. Yeah, it was a great band, right? I was totally into that band. Uh, but it sounded like, you know, some elemental thing, you know, it seemed to be in keeping with Aikido, Earth, Wind, and Fire, right? So he draws the th these three characters on my, on my gi. So I, I'm wearing the gi and I'm in class and can I sit say, you know, he's teaching class and he's walking around watching people and he comes over to me, he starts looking at my, he starts looking at my sleeve, you know? <laughs> and he's looking at it, he's looking at it and finally says, huh, windy chimney. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, he, then he, he just looked at me and just walked away. <laughs> yeah. oh, that was the last time I did that, I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, God, that's hilarious. I, I made every mistake you could possibly make. You know? I, I want to just say here, you know, sometimes... Sensei would speak in Japanese and sometimes not. And one of the craziest things that ever happened to me, and it was, I think, a, a turning point in, in Aikido, one of those kinds of points that you go back and reflect on. And, uh, and it was a com confusion of words. So I, I met Toei Sensei in 1974, and then in 1975, we had, uh, we had a summer camp and we were in a very small building and, and uh, we were, and there was an open skylight and the birds kind of sat on the top of the skylight and it was, it was actually opened so they could see in. Anyway, I was learning how to do the break fall in Shionage. So we were doing Shionage and, and this was the first summer camp and so, I'm, I'm doing this break fall and I'm asking, I'm asking my students or asking the, uh, the members I'm practicing with, not my students, to throw me in this Shionage break fall so I could do it. So, and I wasn't asking them to do that, but I was just asking them to throw me. So they were doing that. And so I worked with one guy and he was doing that. And then we were practicing and then he was, he got tired. So he, 
He said, I, I, I can't practice, I'm too tired. I said, okay, fine. So this is all, this is all during one, one uh, technique, Shionage. Sensei's looking around. And so I asked another guy next to me, uh, could, you, could you throw me like this? Is that, yeah, okay. So he's throwing me. So I, he gets tired. I'm not tired. He gets tired. So I throw him. He doesn't do it, but then he throws me. And back and forth. At any rate, so I go back to the first guy. And he throws me until he gets tired. We're still, I mean, it's not like he's thrown me 20 times. He's just, he's just tired. I don't know why. So I, I accept this. I go back to the second guy. He says, he holds his hands up and says, no, I don't want to practice. So I go to a third guy. And that time, Sensei is noticing something strange is happening. So he comes over and he says, what are you doing? And I explained I wanted to learn how to do this uh, high fall on the Shionage. So Sensei, and we all know how this is. Sensei throws you down and then you get, you get up and he throws you again. But this time, Sensei swung around and threw me down in Shionage. And he says... I, I hear him say, kick up, kick, kick up. So I know better than to kick him, but I did kick up. He steps back and just, boom, hits, kicks me right in the side of the head. And he says, get up. And I go, oh, not kick up, get up. So he, so he, because he doesn't let me go. He's holding on to my she and I. So I get up and he bang. And he says, get up. Now I hear get up, nothing more than, there's no kick up. It's bang, bang. Around the fifth or sixth time that he's done this in a row without letting go, I started saying, I don't know what's going to happen here. So I better start relaxing. So I just started relaxing and hitting the mat. Boom, 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 boom. And he kept, so he kept doing it when I finally hit the ground, I was laying down, I looked up, and these birds were like looking down like, what's going on down there? And, and then Sensei says, now understand? And of course, I immediately said, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. And then all the black belts rushed me because I'm, I'm a second cue at this time. The black belts rushed me and tell me, what a bad guy I am, and why would I kick Sensei, and whoever would kick Sensei, and what kind of guy would do that? And, and later I tried to explain to Sensei what I was doing, and after class, I immediately went over and apologized more and more. And, and later on, that, later on after that summer camp, it got back to me that I was being called Mad Dog Bird Song. For kicking, up at, for kicking up at Sensei, and and I never, I mean, I never, I never kicked Sensei. Now people said I kicked Sensei, but I never kicked Sensei. I I kicked up, but never kicked him. But boy, he kicked me in the side of the head. He kicked me, and I can still hear hear that ringing in my ears. And then when he said "get up," and so get kick. Chicago, Chicago. <laughs> it's all the same. You got to know what you're hearing before you do it. So, but lesson learned. That's about the craziest thing. Yeah. But I will say, I didn't fear falling at all from then on. There, I could take uke me from anybody, and I, I, I liked, I liked being thrown. Wow. So I, I kind of lost the fear of, the fear of flying in that case. Mm. So that was a plus. Yeah, it's a great story. Yeah, they, you got to keep getting up. I, I remember, yeah. I remember um, one time. Uh, I think it was in Mexico City. I was with Sensei at a seminar, Karita Sensei's dojo, and uh, long time ago. And um, I had never seen Kanai Sensei do a demonstration. He didn't like to do demonstrations. And whenever an opportunity came up, he would send students. But we were there and they were doing this big demonstration. And so he had to do a demonstration. And, uh, you know, Mexico City is like very high. So when you, when you get there and you start practicing, you feel, the, you feel the lack of oxygen, you know. So I was pretty tired, but 
I didn't know at that, since I'd never seen him do a demonstration, I didn't know that his kind of way of doing a demonstration, one of his basic ways was like, he would just take somebody and just keep throwing them, keep throwing them, bang, 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 like, you know, 20, 30 times, just one after the other. You know, as soon as you get up, they throw you down. So I didn't know that. So he, he calls me for a demonstration. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, okay. So I attack him, boom, I'm down. You know, I look up, he's standing there. I get up, he throws me the bang, bang, bang. Like, you know, I don't know, six times, seven times. And then like, I'm starting to, I'm starting to figure out, I'm starting to figure out like how this demonstration is going to work. <laughs> right around the ta- same time, I start thinking, I cannot get up again. I cannot get yeah. up. And like, so I'm sure he saw me like just, you know, like <laughs> laboring to get up. And I hear this, I hear this under his voice, get up, get up, get up. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh God, that was torture. Yeah. Finally it ended at some point. David yeah. said, didn't you take a break fall in Ikeo somewhere? From yeah. Where, what was, what was, I think I've seen, I've seen that. The famous oh God, break fall. I think I invented it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was at the, um, it was at the um, 1984 New York um, 20th anniversary <coughs> of Hunter College. And yeah. uh, Toei Sensei was there. Joe was there. All the, all the Shihan were there. They were all there. Tamara Sensei was there. Yeah. Uh, Doshu was there and, and, and Waka Sensei, I think, too, right? Or was it Osawa Sensei that time? It was Osawa Sensei at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, so Tamara Sensei, uh, who was really amazing, um, you know, he, Kanai Sensei always said that Tamara Sensei had like O Sensei's movement. And, uh, but anyway, I, I had met him a couple times before, I guess. He'd given a seminar, I think. Um, up in uh, in Canada, like in the in the at an inn, like north of Montreal, one time it went on for like several days, and so I was there. I happened to be there, and so I, I'd gotten to know him and taken a chemi for him. So somehow he had to do this demonstration. He 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 told me to come, uh, you know, be the UK for the dem- one of the UKs for the demonstration. There were four of us. So um, uh, yeah, so. Um, uh, he 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 was very uh he had the power to cloud men's minds you know so really so so w- the demonstration starts and we get out there there's four of us we're sitting on one side of the mat he's sitting at the other and like i had no idea what was going to happen i'd never done a demonstration with him or anything so uh and i you know, so we're there and he he gets up after we all bow he starts walking across the mat to us and he's like sort of like pointing around, like, you know, like, Magnum. sort of like Mr. Magoo, you know, he's squinting and <laughs> like pointing, you know, and he's, he's, his, his point is going back and forth and, and everybody's sitting there like, look, all the UKs are like looking at each other like, is it me? Is it you? Is it, you know, <laughs> everybody's like, Ugh. I think, I think finally I got, I think I might've been the first one up. I, I don't know if it was on that first one, but you know, I felt like he had gotten us so discombobulated. We we're so easy to throw after that. Like everybody was like a, a total wreck before he even did anything. Right. Anyway, he, he, he threw this Ikkyo into me that was so strong. And I somehow took a break fall. And um, yeah, and then I was like, what? <laughs> that was that, what, what tech, oh, it was Ikkyo? <laughs> another screw up, right. another mistake. But uh yeah somehow i somehow i i did that i've seen a couple people do it since but i don't know probably somebody did it before but that's great vantage footage of you and tamora sensei and kanai sensei and that whole demonstration was just filled with great great uh, uh examples of of what these guys personalities were sagano sensei had was was throwing uh uh, Harvey, Harvey, uh, Ma, uh, Harvey Coinberg, and then there was another big guy from uh, from oh, James Keller. Yeah, I don't think it was. Well, he and uh, Harvey and James did a demonstration in the New right. York Daikikai, but with Sagano Sensei, there's another tall guy from from the. Uh, he was kind of a 
he was younger looking than than um, than Harvey, but he was a senior. He was one of the senior. Oh, guys. was that Tiki from France? Um, I don't. I'm not sure. I, I think it was a. I think it. Any rate, if you went yeah. back to see that, you can you can see those uh, those pictures. But uh, but uh, Sagano Sensei just surprised them all and threw threw Harvey. He threw Harvey so quickly that he Harvey didn't know what exactly what to do, and he just kind of tossed him down, and then threw, threw went on and 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 Tamura Sensei and and Sagano Sensei were doing both basically the same kind of thing. They would just attack, 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 and they they'd be on you before they you could pick you up. We talk about uh, how Oh Sensei uh, it talks about how these techniques could kill you. If if done way too strong or something, isn't shihonage a killer technique? If just thrown straight down. Well, it's one that we we are supposed to have heard that. <laughs> I, Max, Max was divulged the secret technique. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> well, it's the one that supposedly somebody had killed somebody doing shihonage. I heard Arikawa sensei killed someone doing shihonage. Yeah, and and not that, that I want to mention any names. Yeah, I just didn't know who it was. So I, but I, but from the very beginning, and that's kind of why I kept shionage out of the curriculum for children. But I do see people still do shionage with kids, but mm. that's why I, I, I kept it away because it's a pretty dangerous. I think all the techniques are dangerous if if you really don't if you really don't uh, uh, work right. If you if you if you if you work too hard, then you can't do it because you're just getting in your own way. But if it's if if it's done well and Uke doesn't know how to take Uke me, then it could be quite dangerous. It's, it is dangerous. That's why you're, yeah. you're supposed uh, to take it's care. It's interesting of when you see someone who who doesn't know about Uke me or even doesn't know a particular version of a technique. Right. They they really can get wiped out when they when they try yeah. to do it. So, right. um, I think the techniques work much better on people that don't do Aikido, for example, or or uh, than they do on people that do Aikido who you know know, know everything. So uh, it means um, it means that uh, you know it, it, well we have a particular way of practicing that's des I think designed to you know optimize what we're learning. But uh, you have to use a little imagination also to imagine if you want to um, how the techniques would work on someone who doesn't know Ukemi. And you can take a look at the beginners and how beginners will beginners will fall fall down before you even you know you take them around in a rimi naga and they're falling down they don't know what you're doing so they're falling down before you ever throw them they know you want to they know that you you want to get them to the floor but they don't know exactly how to do it we experience that all the time with beginners and and since i teach uh college college students every semester uh I have kids falling all kinds of different ways, so I spend a lot of time teaching them how to fall down, so they, so they can fall for one another and while they're practicing. So, Joe Sensei, you you still teach um, uh, sort of like a college course? Is that is it like a three credit or a two credit course or something? Is introduction? It, to yeah, it's a it's a uh, kinesiology class at the community college. Yeah, that's a, do, yeah, it's a it's like keto class. Yeah. How long have you done that? Uh, I I uh, initiated this class in 1986. I came I came to Austin to open up a dojo in 1984, and I opened up a dojo. And I was working at a state at a state uh, Texas school for the deaf, and we had a dojo in a kind of a little practice room with a with a little mat. But uh, in in I left that that job in. 86 and I got a job at the college in the spring of 86 and uh, and basically I was teaching weight training and got a couple of classes but that summer of 86 I I started the first Aikido class and have been teaching since 1986 at the so 30 33 34 years at the at the community college so during that time I've had thousands of Thousands of students, three classes, uh, three classes. Uh, sometimes I've had four classes of Aikido. Then I got tired of teaching 
four classes of Aikido and, and seven days of Aikido at the dojo. So I started teaching tennis and doing other classes besides Aikido. And then there was another guy who, who came in and started teaching Aikido. He was from uh, uh, Imai Zumi Sensei, I guess, is a guy from New York. You might know him, David. I don't think I, I don't think I know him. Yeah, he's, he, he was my, my uh, college colleagues uh, uh, teacher. So, so Mark Leidig and myself now still teach Aikido. So we, we used to have, we used to have uh, five or six classes. And now I have two classes of Aikido and he has uh, one class. He teaches Tai Chi as well. So, Sensei, you, you've collectively taught thousands of students. What makes a good Aikido student? They don't ask too many questions. I was going to say, I was gonna say they're, keeping their mouth, they're keeping their mouth shut. Well, I say that. They don't ask too many questions. And then at the same time, you know, David and I learned completely different. Both can I, Sensei? And, and uh, Toei Sensei, when they first came, they didn't speak a lot of jazz. Uh, well, I don't know about Kanai. No, he didn't. But he didn't speak English. And, and Toei Sensei didn't speak English. And, and so uh, I, think, uh, I, I, I think what is really important is to, is to watch, is to, is to watch and, and try. It's, it's tough to because you're seeing things you haven't seen before, so you don't know how to ask questions. And some teachers didn't, didn't want you to ask questions, and you just did it. And that's kind of the way they, they practiced it. What do you think, David? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, when someone comes in and really tries to immerse themselves in it by uh, practicing a lot and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, cleaning the dojo and participating in the dojo life and right. trying to get involved in, in, in different ways and yeah. And asking questions or at least something that shows they're thinking about it and trying to grasp it. And, but I think it's, it's, I don't know. I, it's hard to say because people are so different and uh, also at different stages of, of their Aikido uh, journey or, or uh, uh, they, they're in different places, but I think, I, I think that, um, you know, when I see someone that really, really is trying to immerse themselves in every aspect of it, that, you know, that to me is sort of a sign of a good student. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah. Well, some students, uh, it, it's interesting because during uh, a period of time when I was studying with Toei Sensei and, and actually living in Chicago and being Uchi Deshi and later Soto Deshi. Inside Uchi Deshi, inside apprenticed, Soto is outside. So still being apprenticed, I lived, I lived in the Chicago area for two years and studied with Sensei for two years and then went back to Champaign-Urbana where I was going to college. And uh, but the thing that, that uh, I think you have to, for, for me, I think a good student is, is someone who wants to, you don't have to be friend with your teacher, but you, 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 want to, you want to follow your teacher. I have people who don't call me sensei and I don't care that they don't call me sensei because for them, uh, I'm Joe. Okay, fine. I, I can't ask you. I once asked Sensei, what, what do you want me to, how do you want me to treat you, Sensei? And he said, I can't, I can't tell you that. Well, I, if I tell you how to treat me, then I'm acting like a, a, a king, and I'm not a king. So you can, you can treat me as you wish to treat me. I mean, certainly he didn't want me to kick up, but, uh, but uh, I think, you know, and and the things that, that I understand that's important from Toei Sensei wasn't that he said, these things are important. He would just say, well, this is how I remember these things. So he would, 
he would give us a model. And as, and I asked him once because he was traveling with, with he was going to go to the United States. He told us a story about when he and uh, Doshu Kishomaru, uh, O-sensei's son, were going to travel to what he said was the enemy. He was talking about traveling to America and both of he and Doshu were traveling. And he said, very interesting. I said, well, what did O-sensei tell you about this and how to, how to treat his son? He said, he didn't tell me anything. I said, how did you, how did you learn? He said, I learned by watching and doing what others did. And to me, that's it. He didn't, he, he asked. And what he said of that trip, he said they were both nervous, but he said that Aikido made, made us both realize we, we lost our fear of America, the enemy, through that, through that, uh, through Aikido, and and how they how Aikido people treated them, well, so welcoming and so uh, respectful. He said they he would they were both fearful because they were still young guys. And anyway, so. yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point. Talk about a good student. It's like being observant. That's. Uh... That's another sign of a good student, just someone who looks around, sees what's going on, sees how, what other people are doing, um, tries to do what other people are doing. And, and that's a lot how you learn to uh, do Aikido and uh, how you learn to sort of function in Aikido's world of etiquette. And um, uh, a lot of it is... Uh, left to you to to figure out by observation, and, and like Joe said, uh, uh, can I sense they seldom would would uh, tell people anything about you know their behavior. It had to be something like that was really bugging him for him to say something about anything like that. And um, yeah, and uh, you know, and those guys were so that had so much gravitas that. You know, I don't know if I don't know I don't know how people treated them when they first got there, but um, by the time I came along, they 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 were such heavy heavy duty guys that uh, you, you know I sort of immediately just got the vibe that uh, yeah. you know you should treat them with uh, respect yeah. and um, you know not uh, not be too uh, I don't know what do you say uh, casual or. Right. Uh, not think about not think about how you were behaving, um, and um, yeah, I guess that's the old way. I guess in the old martial arts way of teaching, they didn't explain anything; they just did it, and then you try to copy everything and try to, try to copy steal what it. Doing. Hmm? Steal, steal the techniques. Steal the techniques, right? Yeah. You're supposed to steal the techniques in the old days. So yes. if you're supposed to steal the techniques and they're not being explained to you, is, is that sort of a way where um, only the martial artists who have the natural ability to just watch it and do it sort of can get there and the rest a trit out? Cause they, no, no, I don't think so. Okay. Think the thing that, the thing that, uh, the thing that it's not like someone who's a martial artist can see the stuff. Someone who spends a lot of time looking at it and trying to understand it whether whatever their natural proclivity is, if they, if they concentrate really, really watching, really trying to figure it out and it may not be fast. And, you know, a lot of people that become really good at Aikido are terrible when they start. And, uh, you know, it's, it's that, it's like giving it that attention. That's what makes that, that's what the thing is. It's not like, uh, nobody can, you know, nobody can look at this stuff and do it. I don't think. And, uh, so if you want to, if you do want to try to copy it, you got to keep looking at it, like keep looking at it, keep looking at it, keep looking at it. You know, you try to do it and you think about it and like, what about this? What about that? And um, it's a lot of work. I mean, it, 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 so I, I don't believe it's like a natural proclivity. I think it's just the willingness to give it enough attention and care. Yeah, there's always been that case where people go, oh, well, he's a natural athlete. And this guy is not, but we've seen we've seen uh, people come in and wouldn't know their right foot from their left foot, and then 
you know, 10 years later, they're, they're doing Aikido pretty well. And, you know, they're not, they're not ashamed of what they're doing. Uh, two things. Uh, I was reading your, your questions, Ricky. And one of the things that came up, I didn't see it, but I wanted to ask David, what do you remember? What do you remember? Uh, what are some of the first things that you remember being told of either about Aikido or told by uh, Kanai Sensei in your earliest, I mean, your earliest recognitions of, of what you can remember him, him saying to you or uh, about Aikido? Well, I think one of the first memories I have is, I think, I think it was at my first summer camp, which I think was 1978. Um, they had a panel discussion. Uh, Arikawa Sensei was there, that camp. Yeah, from and, Vancouver. Uh, no, 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 not, uh, not, um, no, you oh, think. Karahawa. Yeah, that was no. Kar no. Arikawa from Hambu. Oh, hi. So that's, hi. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I remember Kanai Sensei, or no, maybe it wasn't on the panel session. Maybe he was sat down at a table at um, one of the meals that I was sitting at the table. I mean, he wasn't coming to talk to me. I was just like in the vicinity of whoever he was coming to talk to. And I heard him say, Ukemi is the cutting edge of your technique. Bye. That's yeah. one of my earliest memories of him saying anything. Bye. And, um, uh, it's so important. Yeah. You can't get up. You can't play. <laughs> you can't do Aikido anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think another part of the idea is just that, you know, you got to, you got to be able to actually feel the technique and feel somebody really do it to you strongly in order to understand really how the technique works. Right. And you can't people, you, in order to let people throw you strongly, you got to be able to take Ukemi. Yeah. So uh, I think that's, that's one of the parts of how you, how you learn to do the technique. So I think it's true. I think I, I, I think I believe that today that you learn more about the technique from taking the ukemi than you do by learning how to do the technique or as much or very significant portion. Well, and, and that's that one where they say, uh, san nin, uh, ukemi no san nin, meaning ukemi in three years. And there's a, that kind of a saying that I heard, uh, and it was talking about how you need, you need, it takes three years to really perfect, perfect Aikido. And then, the, then there was a story where you, you, when you came in, in the early days, you just took Ukemi and people just threw you around for a year or so, or maybe shorter time, longer time, three years, I don't know. But uh, you got to remember, Ricky, that in the early days, you had to be a fifth Don and be, um, uh, and be given a, a letter of, of uh, introduction by two people that would back you up. So to you be, were already a fifth. You were already a fifth on in some other martial art before right. you even came into Aikido. Right. So that's at least that's the story. Uh, that's the story of the the old hell gym. Two things that that I wanted to say. First thing, I had a teacher before Toei Sensei, and it was his name was. Uh, Dong Tree, and because his his last name was Dong and his first name was Tree, but because he he said, spoke it Dong Tree, people thought he was Mr. Tree, so we would just call him Mr. Tree, and he would introduce himself as Mr. Tree. And the first thing that the one thing that I can remember him saying is that he says when you go to a seminar and you and you and these people are coming from the world headquarters or here in wherever, he says, they've seen the best. So you're not going to wow them with your Aikido or your, your techniques or your falling or your flashy, um, flashy gymnastic falling. He said, you're going to impress them with your etiquette, your deportment, how you you dress up, you wear a tie when you go and meet the doshu. Uh, you don't, you know, you don't wear your, your t-shirt that, that has expletives and things. So that was something that uh, he told me. And 
and I've, I've attributed a lot to, to etiquette. And even when people would say, oh, I don't play politics. Uh, sensei says it's not politics, it's, it's etiquette. And the example he gave me, this is, this is Tohei Sensei, is that he had a, uh, he had a fifth on coming in from Japan to teach in his area, and he didn't call him, and he knew him. So when I came down to Texas, I called T.K. Lee, who was the senior, most senior person in Houston and in Texas, and I said, hey, I'm here. And so I was doing what Sensei did. And one other quick one is that one day I did something in the dojo, cleaned up, and Sensei asked, asked something to be cleaned up. And I cleaned it up and I came back and I said, Sensei, it's done now. He said, who helped you? I said, no, I just did it by myself. He said, no good. Go get someone to help you. So I had to, I had to go out and get somebody. I got, got one of the, the members and we went over and cleaned up the same area I cleaned up. Came back, the two of us came back. I said, Sensei, the cleaning is done. He goes, the two of you? Yeah. Good. All right. Now, okay. So what I got from that was that the Japanese are group oriented. They want to do things in groups. We are individually oriented. We want to do it ourselves. See, Sensei, I can do it myself. No good. Do it with someone else. Oh, we can do this. Oh, yeah, better. So it's the same kind of thing as we do Aikido. I don't do Aikido. We do Aikido. Uh, um, yeah, I, th I think that's right. It's like, it's like, it's not about, uh, oh, oh, sensei, I did this, you know, I cleaned up. It's like, no, how, what are you doing to make the dojo work? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's not, look how great I am. It's yeah. look how good we're doing. Yeah, exactly. It's like saying how great, you know, like <laughs> I just ruined it, right? I'm in, in Aikido, you're not supposed to walk around saying, look how great I am. You know, that's like, <laughs> that's like the exact opposite of the attitude you're supposed to have. Yeah. That's why I'm studying Aikido to try to wear that off. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's tough. It's tough. And but with the etiquette, uh, is it, is it instructed upon the students or are the students watching sensei? And if it's the students watching sensei, how do they translate that back to their colleague students on the mat? Well, it's supposed to happen. If the dojo is working right, the senior students are supposed to transmit the etiquette to the junior students and the teacher doesn't do that. Um, that's not the, that's not the teacher's job. Yeah. So, so, uh, the problem is, is that uh, uh, etiquette uh, is not just a matter of rules, but it's a matter of gray areas and application of, of rules in new situations or every situation really is a little bit different. So you can't just uh, like learn the rule book of etiquette and then go out and do it. In fact, you know, it's, it leads to so many funny stories when you find out that some senior student is telling everybody to do something that's wrong because Right. You know, they got some idea about how something is supposed to happen and didn't right. take account of uh, right. other circumstances. Right. Um, and also the other thing that's complicated about etiquette is that it's really impolite to tell people that they're breaching the etiquette, you know, <laughs> like it's impolite to tell someone they're, they're being impolite. You know? so so, what, I mean, so, I mean, how does this all work when someone needs to scooch up a bit to get to the right line before class starts? How do you say it without saying it? You, you poke, you poke your point. I'll give you an example of, here's, here, 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 here's a lesson in etiquette. So in 80, in 1974, Doshu and Kanai Sensei, uh, Yamada Sensei, um, and Tohei Sensei came with Doshu to San Francisco for a de demonstration. And I, I went with uh, Mr. Tree from Sacramento to San Francisco. This was in, in the springtime. And, and it was a black belt seminar in the old Turk, Turk Street Dojo, David. 
Yeah. And so where I first, pra- that's where I first practiced. Yeah. And this was a black belt seminar, only black belts. And there were going to be two classes. So uh, we, we went in and after, after the second, uh, after the first class, I, I went up to um, the Midwest Aikido Federations or the, the Federation uh, president. His name was Bob Basta and, and introduced myself and said I was going to come back to the University of Illinois, which is about 150 miles south of Chicago. And I wanted to, wanted to uh, introduce myself and I wanted to uh, tell Sensei I was going to be practicing there. And so during, after the seminar, we were, we were Sensei uh, was standing on the mat and there were people who were sitting on mats that, that uh, had, their, had their shoes on or shoes off. Basically, they had their shoes on and they came walking out and they were walking across the mat and I was talking to Sensei and Sensei looked down and saw these guys walking on the mats with their shoes. And this is the first thing I saw Shinsei do. He ran over and they just, he just shoved these two guys right off the mat and said something. I, I didn't hear, but I, and they were, you know, they were typical San Franciscoites at the time. Oh, wow, what's going on? <laughs> it's like, boom, get off, the, get off the mat with your shoes. So that was Sensei teaching a lesson that I certainly never forgot. And, uh, and at the same time, I told him I was going back to university and they had an Aikido club there. And, and he said, oh, they don't, and then Bob said, oh, they don't have it there anymore. And I said to him, may I start a class? I was a second Q at the time. Wow. And he said, sure, go ahead. And I did, and that cl- that that dojo has been ongoing, and it's now it's a it's a city do- citywide re- dojo called the Central Illinois Aikido Club. But that was that was a lesson I saw a Sensei get very serious, and boom, just push these people right off the right off the mat. And I knew I knew he was a serious guy right from then. But then turned around and said, "Go ahead, open a dojo." Well, I think can I sense I often gave that advice to someone in that situation. If someone was like second queue and they were moving someplace, yeah, that didn't have any aikido, right? And they'd say, "What should I do?" He'd say, "Start a dojo," right? Say, but I'm only second queue. He said, "Well, you know, start a dojo, right?" And uh, if you're if you're the the only person that that knows anything and you're in some area, there's no Aikido, start Aikido, start, start up Aikido. Yeah. And uh, I thought that was interesting because a lot of people would be, I think a lot of people would be surprised by that if they were going somewhere, they'd say, Oh, but I'm only this or I'm only that, but it's not how it worked. It's not how he's not how can I sense they would see it anyway. Well, and now sometimes, uh, you know, and, and, and we're talking 1974, you know, there wasn't much Aikido going on. Right. There was probably 10 Aikido books in, in existence at the time, English, at least. There weren't very many Aikido books, so there wasn't much going on. So if you were, uh, if you were a teacher, uh, you, you weren't going to be a black belt. And, and, it, and it was from that dojo I studied, I studied with uh, Sensei from that Champagne Urbana Dojo and got went on and got my first and my Shodan and my Dinan test. And, and, and when I came down here in, uh, in uh, 82, I was going to uh, take my Sondan examination. And I, had, I was living in Texas at the time, not in Austin, but uh, West Texas. And I asked Sensei, hey, uh, can I take my Sondon test? And he said, uh, he said, uh, where's your dojo? And I didn't have a dojo. <laughs> he said, where's your dojo? And I said, well, I always thought that the Midwest Aikido 
uh, Sander was my dojo. He goes, I don't think so. And he goes, you're now Ronan. And Ronan uh -oh. is, and, and so. You're a solo. I, I was, <laughs> I was, I was, I'm a solo operator. Yeah, you're and, Ronan. <laughs> and so I was Ronan because at that time I didn't have a dojo. And, and I think also I, I left. They said I that to you? Sensei said that to you? Yes, he did. Wow. And, and so, and, and, part, and, and partly I think it was because that uh, I got down here and it was so warm and wonderful. I just, I just kind of left. I knew I was leaving the dojo in good hands, but it's the way I left and the way I didn't tell Sensei. And I think, etiquettely, I did it wrongly. So no. had I, and and so it wasn't until uh, nineteen. This was nineteen eighty-seven. I took my, I took my Sondon five years later. But by that time, I had a dojo. I actually, yeah, I had had a dojo. So my first dojo was the eighth dojo in the Midwest Aikido Federation. And then the Austin dojo was the 20th dojo. And, and before Sensei passed away, there were 46 dojos in the Midwest Aikido Federation. And now there's five. Yeah. Oh. Um, um, oh, I'm sorry. No, go on. Uh, so we're an hour and a half in, and what I think we should do uh, this this sort of night of forty questions for two Shihans, and we're on question thirteen. Um, although this has been unbelievable, I, I think we should uh, end with a question and then do a second podcast at a later time and pick this up again. Sure. Is that okay yeah. for everyone? Yeah, no, I'm fine with that. Thanks. Okay, so my final question for this evening, but there will be a follow-on podcast, is what do you want your students to achieve when they have studied with you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have an easy no, answer. I, 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 like I, 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 hope my, I hope my students, I hope for my students to love Aikido. I want them to love Aikido. And, and even my beginner, even my college students, I want them to uh, walk away from the class doing a few things, understanding a few techniques, not a lot, but a few. And I always tell them, you know, you're very busy now, but you know, when you're older and you, uh, I hope you have a good feeling about Aikido and that you may, want to come back maybe after you you know you get a job you get a wife you get a family you get a husband you get whatever and i hope that you respect aikido and love aikido uh for my students now at the dojo that's i don't care about their i i care about their their technique their their technique will come technique will come just keep coming to the dojo uh, I just I just uh, celebrated my 50th anniversary in Aikido, and I have uh, still years ahead, and I'm looking to learn more. I'm I'm a consummate learner and and want to practice. I'm, you know, like I said earlier, I'm practicing what David is uh, teaching me, and uh, I respect what. He and Barbara are doing for the dojo, bringing Kanai Sensei's uh, style and information here, and uh, and I want them to keep Aikido alive in in Austin, so that you know the next two or three generations can have this. Uh, we're 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 seeing a whole bunch of people saying, "Oh, we're not very popular," and Aikido is this and Aikido is that, and and it's like. Okay, so the teachers have to keep the population, the, keep it popular. And one, one thing I wanted to add, it's not about this particular question, that back in the day when sensei, when, when the sensei from Japan came and taught, they weren't speaking English, they, some of them could, but uh, they, they were still uh, speaking Japanese. They were teaching us the way they were taught the way David and I may teach, we are now teaching Aikido. 
we're teaching in a different way. We have a different, we've, we've interpreted the way we've learned. And that's what happens. You want you, you want to hook up with a teacher or a senpai that can relate to how you're learning something that helps. But the idea, I, when, after two years, I wanted to teach Aikido. After two years of training, I wasn't even a third Q. I said, oh yeah, I want to teach Aikido. I was a teacher. I was, I was going back to high school. But after, after the second, the fourth year of Aikido, I wanted to promote Aikido. And that's what I'm hoping. My students will love and promote Aikido. That's, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. In all of its, in all of its aspects. That's that's really the a, a perfect answer. That's that's right. I mean, I, if you know, trying to deal with that seriously, I felt like I got something so meaningful. Oh yeah. Out of practicing Aikido and uh, uh, and and how it was, how I felt it came down like from O Sensei through Kanai Sensei to us, and then that's what I would like to pass along to my students. What are, that thing? What what that thing is? And yeah. Um, it was, uh, you know, the Aikido is, is just a, I think, a, just such a great thing. And, and, the, and I, I feel like it, it can do great things to people's personality and character. Not, not always, but, uh, uh, and, and that's what I felt from my teachers. That's, and that's what I, that's what I try to pass along. And, uh, somehow that it, I'm trying to pass along that experience I had to my to my students, if I can, you know, it, it, it gets hard cause you know, but we just do our best to do it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I guess that's it. Just so people can, yeah, can, can love the Aikido and appreciate it. Well, um, thank you guys very, very much. Um, and we can pick this up again and do another podcast and just continue. Is that good? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want okay. to do that. So, David Halpern, Shihan, and Joe Bertong, Shihan, uh, I want to thank you very, very much. I'm honored to have uh, been able to just listen to all of this, and it's going to be a blessing to push it out into the world. And um, on behalf of everyone, this has been Keto Perspectives. Good night, uh, senseis, and thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you.